So yes, my name is Julian, and I'm going to be talking about uh, Python logging, which isn't as high-tech as some of the earlier talks we've had. It's one of the fundamental things. And I know that there's a large range of uh, different levels of people in the room, having spoken to a few of you at a pub. There's some beginners, some quite experienced people. So what I've tried to do is make sure that all of you are equally bored. So I'm going to start with some stuff, just making sure the first-timers introducing what the Python logging is, uh, if you've got some basic understanding, show you what the next steps are. If you're in the middle there, talk about some style and optimization to make sure you're doing it right. And then start talking about what's behind the scenes for the advanced people. And finally, I'm going to try and get a plug-in for um, a customization I've just made that I want a few beta testers to give a go. So that will be what I'll do at the, at the end. So the question of why you should listen to me. Uh, I'm not an expert at Python logging. I've really only used it on the current project I've been doing at the moment for a few months. Um, I, I mean, I've used it before, just the basic stuff, but it's at its full strength. And I have made some pretty bad mistakes. So probably the best reason to listen to me is to find out what I did wrong and try and avoid that yourselves. So what are we talking about? The problem we're trying to solve here uh, for logging is when our program runs, we want to record the events that are happening. And we want to record what happened. We want to record whereabouts in the code it happened, what line, what file, what time it happened, maybe some parameters that have been passed in, some various variables and that sort of stuff, and maybe how critical we think that is. And we need to put that in a format that our users can find and also can understand. Now, one of the tricky parts is, is there is a large number of different users of logging. The first and obvious one is the developer who's just trying to illuminate what's going on in the black box that is their code. So some trace statements and some debug statements to see what's going on in there. But there's also your operations people, uh, your, your system administrators, who want to know that the system is running OK, want to know that the resources are all being used properly, and, and basically just want to be reassured that everything's humming fine, and when it's not, find out why. Uh, there's also your help desk people and maybe also your expert end users, who when things go wrong want to see what happened. When people call up the help desk, they want to be able to say, uh, we see what the problem you had here is, or uh, we can see you're suffering from this bug, there's a workaround for, or a patch, or whatever is involved. And finally, another use for the log file, which I've certainly been finding very useful, is for uh, an audit trail. I'm not talking so much about um, like financial proving that there hasn't been any fraud, uh, but more making sure that the program has been running for as long as it's supposed to have been running. Uh, like, how many users have been using it in the past few days? Uh, did it actually? Did the backup actually happen last night? That sort of stuff. Just making sure that uh, you can say at the end of the month, yes, uh, the program was running for this many hours and, and dealt with this many transactions. So with this many diverse users, you need a fairly flexible system, and Python actually comes with a, fairly, a pretty good system already. So the <coughs> Python logging uh, module is a solution to this problem. It's been around for a while, since 2002. It's bundled in free for Python 2.3 and later. If you're stuck on any earlier versions, you have my commiserations, but you can download some logging modules for that as well. It's highly customizable. I'll be talking quite a bit about this customization. Uh, but to begin with, there's some really easy convenience functions to get you started. So all you really need to do, uh, import the logging module, obviously. You configure how the logging is going to work, and there's a basic config method you can call to do that. Uh, in this particular example, I've said I want to log to this particular file name, and I want to log everything above a certain level. So debug, I'll, I'll explain what that means later, but for now, debug means I want to get all the error messages or all the log messages, I should say. And finally, then you can just call the logging uh, warning or error or debug. There's a number of different methods there. And it goes and writes straight to your log file. So there's three simple statements. And the second one there, basic config, is actually optional. If you drop it out, it'll send your log files to standard error. And it will give you warnings and above. So it will, it will cut out all your debug and info messages, but just give you the, uh, the warning stuff. So it's pretty easy to use. So is the print statement. The print statement is the way you're probably doing it anyway if you don't use the logging module. Uh, so I wanted to talk about what I see as the benefits to going to using logging. 
and I see there are three minor benefits and one really significant benefit. So I'll go through the minor ones first. If you've used the print statement in a multi-threaded application, you'll see that these, the output keeps overlapping each other. You're going to spend your entire time going, wait, that's the first letter of the previous word and there's the rest of the word and that sort of stuff. So the first benefit is that the logging module odds, the logging module adds thread safety. Uh, and each message comes out as one atomic item. Another one I find when I don't use the logging module, I go to remove the, the debug statements that I've added. I'm searching through all my print statements, trying to work out, wait, now this print statement is actually meant to go out to the console, and this print statement was something I just added temporarily. So the intention is clearer. This is about maintainability of your code. You can go in and see, ah yes, this is something that's meant to stay, and this is debug output that can be removed or even better, just filter it out, so you just turn it off, so you don't ha ever have to see it. And the other minor advantage is the optional freebies you get. So your log file can automatically include uh, the severity, which again I'll talk about in a minute, uh, timestamps, uh, whereabouts in the code will occur. If you're doing multi-threaded code, you can throw in the thread name there. If, you're do if you have an exception, you can get a stack trace. So all this can be done with a print statement, but it's just so much easier with the logging command because it's there for free. But I think the real major benefit of using the logging module is the decoupling from your code, which has a job to do, it's got that processing it wants to do, and it just needs to send off some event. And then the actual handling that says, ah, this event is important enough to be written to two log files and emailed to uh, a customer or whatever uh, that is. So being able to separate that and say, I'm gonna worry about that later, or my operations manager can worry about that, and I instead am going to just say, hey, an event happened, deal with it. I think that is the biggest advantage of the logging module. So that, that is the reason which I ended up using. Um, it's also highly configurable. I don't know what more to say about that because I've got a whole lot of other slides to cover it. Uh, I, I guess what I was, my point there was, if you decide later on that you're only going to log to one file, or you're going to log to three files, or uh, you want to register on a web server your events, you can do all that without actually touching the code that raised the event. Severities. Well, this is what I would call severity, uh, what they call levels. I just want to go a little bit deeper in there. Inside the logging module, it's represented as an integer. But there's a whole lot of s symbols which are defined, which you can use instead for convenience. So there's debug, warning, Error and exception are both at the same level of severity. They've just got slightly different behavior about whether they bother to uh, log a stack trace or not by default. Uh, and critical. You can add your own. So you can add more levels in there. If you want super double critical, you can add that. Um, there's a common problem which occurs with bug reports as well, with, as, well as logging. The developer who's writing this code thinks the fact that they can't write their data out to the disk is a critical problem because their code can't do anything else. That's what their code's for. That's what they spent all this time developing. That's a critical problem. But your operations manager uh, in your data center probably doesn't care much that a single hard drive has failed. It seems critical to you, but to them it's something that's going to be dealt with at the end of the month when they do their sweep and replace all the broken hard drives. They know there's redundant servers taking over here. So. Uh, I guess I don't have a real solution here except to say, give it some thought about whether on your particular project you need to go ahead and define these in more detail so your developers know which level of severity is appropriate for which situation. So moving into the second part where I talk about what you're missing out on if you're uh, only using the very basic logging is the configurability. And there is a large amount of configurability. And I, I'm breaking it up into parts. The first is the filtering. Which error messages are you going to bother to write to the log file and which ones are you going to throw away? So built in straight away, you have it by severity. You can commonly say, I don't want to hear about uh, debug messages. I don't want to hear about info messages. In fact, I only want to hear about errors and above. So that's thrown in. You can filter by component. So you can say, I do not want to hear about the database, it just logs errors all day and just bothers me. I want to ignore everything from the database. You can write your own custom filtering where you say, uh, I don't know, the DBA is only on Wednesdays, so uh, on Wednesdays I want the database to filter, uh, and the boss is in on Fridays, so turn off all filtering on Fridays, 
filter out everything on Friday so it looks like everything's going fine. You can come up with your own story there. The actual handling of the log messages are built in for free. There's a large number of ways of doing it. Probably the obvious way is writing to a file or writing to a stream, such as standard error. There's also the concept of uh, rotating files. S there's several different variants of this. Uh, you can say, I don't want any one log file to get bigger than 100K because my editor can't handle it. It's just a bit slow, so it will break it up to generations. You can say, I want to throw away, I only want to keep three of those, so all up, I've only got 300K uh, of logs. You can say, I want a Monday log, a Tuesday log, a Wednesday log. This is just different ways of breaking it up to make the file smaller. Perhaps your system is just one of a larger system and you want to integrate it so that all of the different parts of uh, your applications, all of your applications, are logging to the same place. So the operating systems offer a couple of solutions there. Uh, on uh, Unix, the default, the, 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 the de facto standard is syslog. But uh, on Windows, it's uh, NT events. Both of those can be integrated in quite easily, so your events go and get pushed off to that system where they'll get handled. They've got their own way of handling all sorts of uh, events. Uh, you can have events emailed to you. This is something that I've been using, so that when a critical event happens, I get something in my inbox to let me know what's going on, so I can fix it quickly. You can have it register on a website. You can have your own sockets, so it can go to whatever system you've got on, on another machine. Uh, you can cache stuff to memory so it doesn't go anywhere. Uh, you can write your own custom one. So if you feel that you really want uh, your debug messages to appear in your Twitter stream, you can write your own. Um, and more importantly, you can combine these things so that you can say, as I've done, I want critical messages to be emailed to me. I want errors and above to go into one log file which just has uh, you know, the juicy goodness. And then I want all the debug stuff to go into another log file so when I really need to see it, I can go and have a look at it. And maybe I can put a, a tighter restriction on that so that that only lasts for a couple of days, whereas the error logs last for weeks and weeks. So you do need to do a little bit of configure. Oh, I, I missed formatting. Uh, you can adjust the formatting, which goes from the level of saying, I want to use American dates versus ISO dates versus um, Australian dates. Or uh, I want it to look, I, I've done this, I want the output to be in comma separated value sort of format, so there's commas between it rather than colons. That sort of stuff, you can, you can change the formatting. If you want it to be HTML, you can make it look HTML. The place that you can configure all this is during your application startup. So typically it'll be in your main program or somewhere similar. Uh, you can use defaults. There's either leave it, leave it alone, in which case it goes to standard error, warning it above, or you can use basic config to point out some files, uh, a file where you want the output to go. Or you can do it programmatically. I'll be talking later about a number of components that can be plugged together uh, so you can put these handlers together as, as Python code. Or you can, uh, during your startup, point to a config file. And the config file is a text file that your system administrator can go and change on the fly. Uh, so the next time your program starts up, it can, it can change it. So that's quite powerful. Uh, that's something I was using for, for a while. And another feature which sounds cool to me, but I've never actually tried it, is you can defer to say, I want my program listening to a socket. And when a message comes to the socket explaining how to change the logging, it'll change the logging. So you can change the logging uh, while your application is running from a remote server. So that sounds pretty swish, and I'm sure one day I'm going to find a use for it. Um, and that's built in. I'm hoping there's no password on this. Good. Next, I wanted to talk about uh, improving the way you do logging. So if you had a print statement before that just said, Here's the name of my uh, object, and it has a value of this. Um, you might want to instantly go and just replace the print statement with logging.info, put some brackets about it, and be done. That doesn't work. You have to use the string formatting functionality of Python so that you pass in here. I assume people are familiar with the idea of um, you pass two parameters, and they get substituted <coughs> in where the percentage S's are. If those things are objects, then it goes and calls the stir function of that uh, object to go and do that substitution. So you can do it that way. Uh, so you're really only passing a, a string in that will then get uh, sent out. 
But if you, and that works, but if you run it through PyLint, uh, it will complain. It will recommend instead that you break that up, that you pass the first parameter is your formatting string, and then you pass the other parameters in afterwards. Now the reasons for doing that, I think they're fairly minor, but there's a couple of them. The first is that if you do go and customize your filters and handlers and uh, formatters, they can actually go and have a look at the content of those objects before it gets substituted in the string. So they might be able to see something else in those, look at some other parameters inside that object, some other attributes of that object, and, and decide how to deal with it. So flexibility is one reason. You probably won't ever do that, but if you do ever want to do that, you can do that if you use that style. The other is performance. The actual act of doing the substitution in the string will only be done if it passes all the filters. So if you're, do, if you're filtered out logging.info, the act of substituting those, uh, the name and the value of, into the percentage S's can be thrown away because it doesn't need to be done. And if they are objects, that could be calling a stir function. So in theory, that could be quite expensive. So in theory, that could be saving quite a bit. I see both of those as fairly minor reasons. Uh, but Pilot seems to think it's worth a warning. I wanted to talk also about Heisenbugs. So Heisenbugs are ones where when you add the debugging information, it causes the problem to go away or it causes the problem to uh, appear. So to avoid that, make sure that when you pass those parameters in, if they are expressions, that you're not passing in something that's particularly expensive, which might change the behavior of you if it's a real-time system. Uh, stuff that has side effects, so whether or not it gets executed will affect how the rest of your um, application will behave, and anything that raises exceptions because it's just really confusing. When you're in the middle of an exception handler, you're trying to log out what's going on, and another exception gets raised. There is a helper function to try and assist you with the expensive operations. Because if, if we were writing this in C, we'd be using macros, and if we got rid of the debug statements, uh, they could be optimized out by the preprocessor, so there's no code there. And if we were using a lazy evaluation language like, say, Miranda, it wouldn't bother to evaluate those parameters until it needed to. But in Python, uh, along with a number of other languages, it will evaluate the parameters being passed to a function every time before the function is called. So uh, logger.is enabled for, you can put an if statement checking for that to decide whether or not you're going to call uh, the expensive logging operation. I haven't found that I needed this because I've made sure that all the stuff that I log is, is cheap, but if you do have an expensive operation, this is one way of making sure that it doesn't weigh down the system when you've turned off that logging. I wanted to bring up the issue of whether logging should be tested because it's something that I struggled with to begin with and I think I made a mistake and I changed my mind. So I thought I'd share what I think it is now. I think a question you need to ask yourself is whether your help desk staff and your operations or systems administration people are considered users of your system. If they are considered users of your system, then logging is part of your user interface. It doesn't, it's not obvious at first that that's the case, but it's a way that your users are interacting with your system. So in that case, you should be unit testing, and if your project has requirements in the UI spec, it's probably something that should be mentioned in your requirements in the UI spec, what log messages you're raising, maybe what format they are. If, if you have um, user experience staff members, they might be the people who write your log messages. On the other hand, there's the more typical debug messages which are just being used by the developer to output you know, the contents of X and that, that particular part of the code. And I would argue that you shouldn't be unit testing that. Um, it kind of depends on whether you consider your unit test to be black box tests where you don't know what's going on inside, or white box tests where you're trying to follow a path through them. And you could use debug messages to prove to yourself that you are executing certain parts of your code but there are other ways of doing that, such as uh, you know, coverage tools, which I'd probably recommend over logging. If you do go ahead and say, yes, we are going to unit test the, the debug output, it means that your unit tests become very fragile when you refactor, uh, which is something I was suffering from when I was making this mistake. And it means that if you just go ahead while you're debugging and add a new debug message, 
all your unit tests start failing. One thing to consider is whether you've, with, if you've worked with people like I've worked with and you come up with some sort of policy that says you are going to debug, uh, test debug messages in your project, are they going to then come up with another way of logging in order to avoid uh, the unit tests? And the final thing, which is probably the most important thing there, if you are going to be running your code without the debug messages turned on, then you should make sure that at least some of your tests are testing that code because you may have highs and bugs where turning on the logging changes the behavior. The opposite kind of applies as well. If you're going to allow the flexibility for your sysops, your system administrators to go and turn on uh, more logging, you should be testing that that works too. So now I wanted to take an aside uh, to have a look at some code that I had that had a problem. Uh, fairly simple, it was logging, I'm going to sleep for two seconds, and then it was sleeping for two seconds, and then it was never waking up. I'm checking my log file and it's not waking up. And that had me worried about what was going on with the sleep statement. I stared at the sleep statement for a while saying, well, has duration got a, a huge value? But no, duration was only two seconds. Is two meant to be two days? Am I reading the sleep statement wrong? Is there something wrong with my system clock which is causing it to sleep for a long time? But obviously, it, because of the subject of this talk, it was the logging, the second logging statement was freezing up. And that had me even more confused. What changed between the first logging statement and the second logging statement? Well, it turned out the second log logging statement was starting up, decided it was going to print out the word awake, went to grab the lock, and found that it was blocked on another logging statement. This logging statement here, in this was being run by a number of really important threads, the ones that make me money, and this was some inconsequential background thread. And what it was doing was computing, in the example here, the uh, airspeed velocity of a swallow. And of course, it's been called by a number of different threads, so it's starting out by grabbing its own lock to make sure it's not being uh, called several times by different threads. And it's checking to see whether it knows whether it's an African or European swallow. When it doesn't know that, it was sending out a warning saying this particular swallow has an unknown origin. So this logging statement, the info statement, was waiting for the warning statement to complete. But the warning statement was taking a very long time. Why was the warning statement taking a very long time? Well, it was substituting the value of self into the string. And in order to do that, it called this underscore, underscore, stir, underscore, underscore function on that object. And that was fairly simple. It was grabbing the lock, which is the same lock that I'd grabbed here. And it wasn't a re-entrant lock. It is now, but it wasn't then. So a deadlock was occurring in a really minor thread, and that was causing this logging.info statement to fail. So there are really two messages you can take out of this. The first is that, despite the fact that I've had many years uh, experience in developing real-time systems, I'm still a deadlock causing pillock. So that's one thing to learn from this. But the other to learn from this, I think, is that the logging system, I would argue a logging system has two basic tenets. The first is do no harm. And yet the logging system was taking down my threads, my important threads, because of some minor inconsequential deadlock in another thread. And the second thing I think a logging system has to do is illuminate. It needs to sh shed light on what's going on. And I think this was doing the exact opposite. It was distracting me to be worried about exactly the wrong thread to the one that was in there. Now I not really complaining about the logging system here. I don't think there was a better way that they could have done this. Uh, but I just think it's worth noticing that the logging system is a complex thing. When you add it to your code, sometimes you get bitten on the bum by it. Uh, so just be aware that this sort of thing can happen and, and the logging system can be the cause of problems as well as solving them. All right, so so far I've been only using examples from the convenience functions, the very basic stuff. But what I want to, and, and that stuff is good. It's good for your small applications where you don't really need, you don't, the requirements aren't that big. It's also good for getting your feet wet if you've never used the logging system before. Uh, I'd probably even recommend doing it while you're first writing the beginning of your large system until you understand the architecture and how you want to set up the logging. But anyway, so they're good, but let's see what this baby can really do. I've divided it up into the front end components and the back end components. So the next few slides are about that. 
The front end, the first one is your client, your code that's actually trying to do something. Its responsibilities are to configure the logging, configure all the handling of the logging however you need it, and that's done normally in your main program or somewhere sim similar in your startup. Then it goes and fetches a logger by name. So it goes to the logging module and says, I want this particular logger, and I'll talk a bit about the name on the next slide. Typically, you can have lots of different loggers. Each module can have its own logger. Each method can have its own logger. Uh, but they are all linked up in a hierarchy. Uh, and so that's what the client needs to do. And then once they've got that, they can go and call methods on that logger. The logger object offers the methods that actually uh, emit the messages. The info, the warning, the critical, the debug, that sort of stuff. They have a hierarchy, so there's a whole lot of different loggers in your system in a tree shape. And the tree is represented by its name, which uses a, a dot in an inverted... It's, I guess it's pretty obvious that myapp.database.backup is a child logger of myapp.database, which is a child logger of myapp, which itself is a child logger of the uh, logger that just has an empty string as its name, which is the root logger. So there's a whole lot of loggers. Each logger has an associ associated filters with it if it likes. It doesn't have to. Uh, they can filter by level or they can filter by some other rules. You can also have a number of handlers uh, associated with it optionally. And they actually do stuff. I'll be talking about the handlers in a second. But by default, a new logger won't have uh, a filter or a handler. So what that means is you can go and, if, if if you go and come up with a new logger name that the system hasn't heard of, it will give you a new logger, and all it will do is pass the buck upwards. It will uh, just give the message, it won't output, it won't filter it, it will just give the message to its parent, it will give the message to its parent all the way up until it gets to the root logger, and the root logger has some default behavior. So the consequence of this is the cost of coming up with a new logger, a new sub-logger, one for your module, one for your method, one for the part of your method, however you want to do it, uh, is fairly cheap. So just go ahead and add more granularity. It gives you flexibility later to filter based on it or change the behavior based on what the level is. So I've talked about the two front end things, the, uh, the your, your code and the logger object, which is the most visible part of the logging module. Behind the scenes is the handlers. So the handlers are the things that actually do the work, whether that's writing to a file or sending an email or uh, putting it on your Facebook page, whatever it is, that is. They also have filters. This surprised me the first time I saw it, the idea that uh, you have a filter on your logger that decides whether it's going to propagate it up and whether it's going to send it to the handler, and another filter on the handler that decides whether it's going to do anything with it. Uh, so in, in the terms of the logging module, both of these are called filterers, which I think is a great name. The handler is what, what uh, does the locking to make sure that no two uh, messages are emitted by the same handler at the same time. And this is where a number of different subclasses are offered by the logging module that you can come and pick up and, and use as building blocks and Lego to put together. So there's a file handler and a stream handler and, and the rotating file handler and uh, email handler and that sort of stuff. Or you can write your own which I suspect most people won't do. I have done this, and that's what I'm going to be talking about uh, in, the, in the last section. Finally, there's a couple of smaller, less important objects. One is a filter. We've already seen that's been used by the handlers and the loggers. Uh, just returns whether or not a particular message uh, should be propagated or omitted. And there's the formatter, which decides how you want the string to come out. Um, you, it is past a dictionary of fields, so it's past the message text, it's past all those parameters you passed on the command line, and also all these freebies, such as uh, what class was raising the problem, uh, so what file, what line, what the level was, what the thread name was, that sort of stuff. You can add your own custom fields and pass those on the command line, on the command line on, in the call, the logging method, if, uh, if you want on your project. The basic formatter, there's a class offered there that you can use. Uh, it accepts a string that, that it'll substitute all those uh, fields into. It also accepts a date format, which is not really important. You can subclass your own. So the, there's the trivial things.
let me put it all together to recap and show you the flow here. Your client goes and grabs a logger from the logging module. It calls a method on that to uh, emit a message such as warning. The logger then goes and applies any filters to decide whether it's going to continue. If it decides it is going to continue, it goes and f talks to all of its handlers and tells them about the message. They go ahead and apply their own filters. Then they do uh, locking the thread safety. They apply the formatter. And finally, at last, they do the work of sending that message out. Once all the messages on a particular lo uh, logger are done, it optionally passes up to its parent, which does the same thing, decides whether it needs to do any filtering, do any handling, uh, and then it passes up to its parent. So this is, I guess, the, the key flow that shows all the different things that can be adjusted, which is what makes the logging module so flexible and so customizable. When you, your application starts getting too large, it's time to break up the files. And I've talked about breaking up the files by date, but there are, uh, I think, another two ways of doing it. Uh, one is by module, and the other is by session. And by session, it depends on your application. I'm talking about a user session, or a transaction, or uh, a thread. That depend, depends on your, your particular needs. Um, let me explain these in excruciating detail. First, You've got, by module, you're breaking it up. So if you've got three layers in your code, a database layer, a business logic layer, uh, and your web server or whatever your front end is, you could put all the output into different log files. This is, should be familiar. If you're using an Apache server, it's probably writing its Apache log out into one directory and one log file. If you've got MySQL on the back end, it's probably already doing that. So you're familiar with the idea of different parts of your application logging to different uh, files. And there's a benefit here that your DBA only needs to know about transaction type problems and your uh, web administrator only needs to know about webby type stuff. Uh, and it gives a good example of general trends. If your database is failing, if, you, uh, if your well, email notifications are down, you'll see that in one log file, all of the different users are having problems with their emails. But it doesn't give you a good storyline uh, in that if you, a, a DBA might be able to say, I can explain why our database is running so slowly. All these people are making calls on me with all these slow transactions. But you can't see what those transactions are and why. You have to go and find in another file what's going on there. So another way of doing it is by session. So um, if you're writing a backup server to do backups, rather than putting the file copying logs in one directory and then the compression of all that to a, a tar file in another directory and then details about the FTP in another directory, you can put all that information about one particular backup in one file. So someone can actually see whether the backup happened in one place. Uh, and this gives a good storyline. So someone can ring up the help desk and complain what, about uh, you know, the, tr the credit card purchase didn't go through. They can look it up and they can see what that user did, uh, where the transaction started, why the transaction failed, and see whether there's a bug here or some user error or uh, whether error messages need to be improved, that sort of stuff. On the other hand, I've certainly had the problem where I've rung up a help desk saying, my connection to this particular web server is down, and they've taken me through uh, details of how the proxies are, proxies are set up on my machine and what's wrong with my browser, before finally finding out that, oh yeah, my entire suburb uh, has no network connectivity. So you miss out that sort of the, the forest for the trees when you're just looking at your session information. The reason I bring this up is because the way it's done in logging is quite different, and the logging module is quite different. So if you want to split by module, which is the first one I described, it's really quite easy. When your program starts up, for each of your different uh, handlers, for each of your different parts of your code, you can point them to the various files. So you can say, my database class, uh, classes are going to go to the database.log. You then turn off propagation so they don't all go up to the top. Once it's been logged, it can stop. Alternatively, you propagate up and make sure your root logger doesn't do anything. And you can do all this in a config file, which, which really is quite impressive that you can defer this sort of issue of where this logging is going to happen 
to an operations manager uh, out in the field. Each class has a fairly simple task to do. It goes and gets its own logger by name. It knows what that name is. It's based on uh, the, the file it's in and what subdirectory it's in. So if, if you're going and writing the, um, I don't know, the upload stuff, it's, un that was a bad example. I'm gonna just skip out on this example, I'll do exception handling here, um, and say it's easy, it's based on the file name, it's based on where it does in your code is. So this offers some really good decoupling, as I was talking about before, between the client raising the problem and the code that actually deals with the handling. If on the other hand you wanna do it by session, and I think there's some really good reasons for doing it by session, it, logging module doesn't make it easy. For each individual session, you need to go and create your own handler just for that session, your own logger, and then attach your own handlers. So somewhere in the middle of your code that is starting up a new user, you have to know that, oh, and I want all this to go into this user's log file, which I found a bit messy. You can't do it in a config file because the config file can't know the user IDs that you're gonna have. So it can't have a full list of all the different handlers it's gonna require. There's one handler for every user who logs in. And once you've created this special logger with this special handler, you then need to pass it around as a parameter to all your different methods. So I've got all this code now that has, you know, go and do this stuff, oh, and if you have any problems, here's the logger I want you to write the output to. So that's really kind of messy. Another way I could have done it is to uh, have an agreed algorithm of how you generate a logger name based on the user ID. So then I just need to pass the user ID around and it's probably something I was gonna pass anyway. Uh, a third way, which I'll probably do next time, uh, is to use thread local storage. So kind of put a logger in, um, because I've got a thread per session, I can get away with this, put a, a global uh, per thread that is the logger. So this isn't such a good example of the decoupling. This is quite tight coupling between your code and the logging system. Um, and it means it doesn't play well with others. If you go and download a, a third party component, you can be pretty sure it's not gonna log to the, the file that you wanna log it to. Uh, the config file is an area of active development at the moment. I haven't been following closely enough. I've kind of got a vague hope that it might address some of this stuff, but it's really just a vague hope. Uh, I don't know whether they're gonna be able to do that. Uh, so I guess in summary, there are a number of advantages for split by session on some projects. Uh, it is more work. I think in my project it has been worthwhile doing that, but it's something to think about because all of the documentation for the logging module tends to drag you over towards this side, splitting by module, because it's easy using the logging module. Um, so now, coming up to the last part of the talk, uh, just a couple more slides, it's another war story. I have an operation that sometimes runs slowly, and uh, I discovered it runs slowly for reasons outside my control. The virtual private server I'm on, sometimes some of the other users of the same machine start using up all the resources, and my system runs slowly as a result. So I need to go and ring up and complain about that when that happens. Uh, I put some code in there to handle this, to let me know. So what it does is it notes the start time, logs saying I'm, I'm about to start, it does this operation and then measures the elapsed time. And if the elapsed time is greater than some threshold of what I think a reasonable amount of time for this operation is, it sends a critical message. Now this is a, a very pricey version of, of the actual code. Uh, and you may notice that the logging.info is occurring inside the section that's being timed. So how long does logging.info take? Well, it's just writing to a file. I've actually done some performance tests. It's about 100 microseconds to log a simple uh, line to the file. And in the grand scheme of things, that's nothing. 100 microseconds is a small fraction of, of the value of threshold. Um, I don't need to optimize that away. How long does logging.critical take? Well, actually, logging.critical sends me an email. So it's how long does an email take? And I figured half a second to a second was about, I, I wasn't really sure, something like that. Uh, but that's outside of the performance critical part, so I didn't care. 
It could take five seconds for all I care. It doesn't matter. So I deployed that code and it ran well for weeks until one day it blew up in my face. What happened was something somewhere caused a critical message to occur. And this, is, this code has been run by a number of threads, a pool of threads. And a couple of them came in, oh sorry, so a critical message is being sent off somewhere and it took, I think it was 900 milliseconds to send that email. So within, within my guesstimate, um, it got to this logging.info and went to log to a file, but it grabbed the lock of the handler and apparently it was sharing a lock of the handler and it got blocked waiting for the email to go out. So two threads got blocked there. Finally, they get released after 900 milliseconds. They come down here, and that is enough to push them over the threshold. So now, two threads go to log an email out, which takes 1.8 milliseconds, uh, 1.8 seconds, I should say, which was enough to get four more threads blocked there, and so it snowballed. So before long, this logging message, which I thought would take 100 microseconds, was taking over 90 seconds uh, and kind of ruining my performance targets. So I, I made some quick changes. The first thing I did is I turned off the email handling. Uh, I moved the logging statement outside and I complained about it on my blog. And uh, a couple of people posted that on to Reddit and I got about uh, a thousand views and quite a few comments, including one from Vinay, who is the maintainer of the logging module. And he came back with some comment. Like, my point is, when I start thinking about how long these operations are going to take, I'm breaking that decoupling. The, the abstraction is leaking, and I'm caring. Oh, oh, this one's an email. It may take some time. This one is uh, info. It won't take long. And then it turned out even that abstraction was wrong, because info could take longer than the critical. Really, I think that should be hidden from people. The logging module should put it off to another thread and return quickly. So then they came back and said, uh, the maintainer of the module said, uh, email, the SMTP library doesn't do that. And that's, that's true. And he pointed out it wasn't just email, but anything that requires uh, IO could block for a while. And even so, if you're sending it to syslog, if you're sending it to HTTP, even if you're sending it to a file, if it's network attached storage, that could take a long time. So I, I absolutely agreed. And he pointed out that the system is very customizable, and I absolutely agreed. And he said, if, I'm, if, if I have a particular problem that no one else has, I can go and customize a solution. And that's where I thought, I don't think I'm alone here. I think anyone who's doing real-time programming in Python wanting to use the lo logging module, they're going to encounter this problem. So. So I decided this, oh, it's back, but not on that one, sneaky. Um, so I decided to make the best of it, and I've written a module to do this generically. Uh, so the way it works is uh, you import it, obviously. This code slightly in green is the code that you would use to create uh, an email handler, an SMTP handler. All I've done is pass that to the constructor of non-blocking log handler, and that just wraps it. Uh, the code below is uh, grabbing the root logger and adding the handler, which is something you would have done with the SMTP handler anyway. So instead of adding the original handler, you add the wrapped version of it. Now when you call logger.critical, what happens is uh, it posts that to a queue and then returns immediately, and in the background in a separate thread, it goes and deals with that. So I've made this module available on uh, PyPy, the, the cheese shop. So that's a, it's, it's in beta at the moment. And what I'm hoping for is some feedback on this in terms of if people think that they've had this problem before and they're happy to see a component that handles this. If people think uh, they didn't realize they had the problem but, but now they do and they'll be happy to try something. Or if people think that Maybe other people have it, but they don't. Or people think I'm crazy, I'm the only person who has this problem. Or people think I'm crazy because I missed the obvious easy solution. Uh, I'll be in the pub afterwards for people to come and uh, give me their feedback. If you do want to try it, it's available for beta now on, on PyPy. 
So that's the end of my talk. I'll have some Q&A afterwards. What I'm hoping that I've achieved is that you're familiar with the logging module now if you hadn't seen it before. On your small projects, you're keen to stop using that old-fashioned print statement and, and start using uh, the logging module. Uh, if you're on a larger project, you can see ways that you can improve the way you're using uh, logging modules. And also, if you are a real-time developer in Python, uh, you'll give, give non-blocking log handler a try. If you want more information, the Python help files have all the details. I haven't gone a lot into uh, individual methods that are available because PowerPoint slides aren't the best way to do that. PEP282 was the original introduction uh, proposal to come up with a logging system. I think they've updated it with details of what actually happened. So that's another way. The module maintainer, uh, I've never heard his name pronounced. I assume it's Vinay Sajib, but I'm almost certainly getting it wrong. He has a uh, a blog where he talks about a number of issues related to the logging module called PlumberJack at blogspot.com. And if you want to try the non-blocking log handler, uh, easy install is probably the quickest way to get it. And I have to say it's in beta, it's in beta, it's in beta. Don't forget it's in beta. And I'd love to hear feedback on uh, my code. I'm, I'm thick skinned, I can take it. Or uh, whether you found it useful or what needs to change there. So now, I will throw it open to questions. Oh, so he was first by that much. <laughs> Go ahead. I'd use my priest covering the 3.8 generation and 2.6 generation. Uh, the non-blocking log handler? Yeah. Um, 2.6. Uh, I, th I was just working through that today, trying to work out which versions it would work on. I think it will work from 2.8 onwards. I haven't tried it on Python 3.x yet. Um, there's nothing particularly specific about it, so it should be fairly portable, but uh, 3.x is going to catch me in surprising ways, I'm sure. Uh, sorry, uh, you know, arrays. Right. So that, right, so I, I do need to run it through uh, the two to three converter and then test it on three. I haven't done that yet. It hasn't been in my project. I'm just going to come over to this question here first, yeah? Uh, terrific presentation. Um, Thank you. When you're logging in a web application under Whiskey, where, where do you, how do you get around the problems of um, what you can write to? So the question is whereabouts in a, a Whiskey application would you log? And I mean, a log of Uh, I, I don't have enough knowledge of that particular area. I don't know if anyone else can jump in. I assume that you would uh, even consider logging... I'm using with Syslog. You're logging to Syslog? Okay, that, that seems like a good solution to me. Is that, has that been a problem? No, it's, it's no, okay. it's a better solution. Uh, I've, I've tried logging to uh, a log, log files using Logger. And yes. I've run into problems on different Linux configurations where Apache So, in whiskey, you're saying watch out for permissions I'm of. Sorry, of a better answer no, no, I'm I'm not running a web application, so I've I've managed to avoid that. I'm not. Uh, yes. Uh, not yet. Okay. So, uh, within I uh, I've actually started writing the page. Uh, when you uh, submit something to PyPy, you have a home page, and I've started writing the text of that page, but it hasn't been uploaded yet. Um, the other one was, with um, you just borrowing all this logging back to thread, do you find that the uh, background thread either gets behind all your logging messages, and then when you find the actual thread, do you actually lose the messages? Uh, so the question is, if the logging system gets behind when you quit, do you lose stuff? And that was a major concern that uh, took me a couple of tries to get right. Um, so I had a number of different theories and I had a number of different ideas there. At the moment, it won't quit your application until the last log message goes out, uh, unless the logging system itself with the handler that you depend on gives up. 
uh, which I think it will after a while, with, even with the email. So that can be a concern if your user type hits quit and it doesn't quit quickly. I don't like the fact that it hangs around, but I consider that more important that in an, when an application is dying and it's got one last thing to say about who killed it before it dies, uh, that message does go out. We don't just say, oh, never mind, it's only the logging uh, thread will we'll kill that early. There's another question over here. So, okay, the question is why isn't the logging module do that? You don't want a response for a web client to stop while a logging message goes out to some file somewhere. Right. So, I, I guess what you're doing is uh, you're validating the position that I'm taking that uh, the logging module should support non blocking logging out of the box because it's a fairly common operation. And certainly that's the position I'm in now. I was hoping, like, this is a vague hope. But if this module proves to be popular and useful, that we could then use that as ammunition to go back to the logging container and say, well, something like this should be in the, in the base logging. Uh, at this stage, he's unconvinced, but it's early yet. That's right, in fact, it, Um, so the, the question is really about the architecture of how that component works, which is almost a talk in itself. Uh, it's one of those bits of code where there's really only 50 or 100 lines of code. There's not a lot there, but every single line's gone through three iterations before I got it right. Um, it not only starts another thread in the background, uh, but it also has to start other threads to keep that thread alive uh, because it's a daemon thread. I have the problem that to close up cleanly, I need people to call the close method. And if I could be sure people were going to call the close method, it would have been easy to write. Uh, but people don't want to do that, especially when in, in the exception handling and that sort of stuff. So I had to do some fancy tricks to try and keep the thread open, but then to die when it had nothing else to do. Uh, so there is. Calling it non-blocking, it, it does, like, when you push to a queue, which is what it's, it's using queue.q at one stage, there is a very short amount of blocking there, but it's short. It, it doesn't have much to do. <coughs> so maybe it's a bit of a lie in the title, but... Uh, what I'm suggesting is if your program is as part of thread safe, yes. and you start using ah. so many multiple threads, and they might be calling good, it good point. So uh, that is another, that was a very early design decision I had to make quite clear. Um, if you are passing an object that should be uh, logged out, you can't defer the evaluation of that string until later. Because by the time you go to log it, 30 seconds later, that object may have changed value. And it might not be thread safe. So the logging module actually, uh, I'm being targeted by something. <laughs> <laughs> The logging module will actually um, work out the value of the string, the message that you pass in, in the client thread before it passes it off to the back, back thread so there aren't any of those thread safety or my object change in the meantime issues. Um, that does have a very slight performance cost of if your handler later on decided it wasn't going to actually output it, it's still been evaluated early on. But I thought that was well worth it compared to the nightmare of, well, you don't want the logging system making your system worse, causing bugs. So I was trying hard to avoid that. Another question here. Um, is there a way to get the class and function that you're in in the logger? Uh, yes, no. wait. No, I'm just being careful here. No, no, no. Um, the formatter is passed a dictionary of a whole lot of information. Yeah, uh, the file and the line number are in there. Yeah. Is the function in there? I, I would have to go and have a look at the, the code again. I'm sorry, I can't no, remember. I've seen a very hacky way of doing it, like get the stack from this 
Ah, yes, that'd be one way of doing it. You could pass that information as a parameter, but that means making sure your developers what do it every time. I uh, yes, it would be. Sorry, what's the question? We can create a new logo for that Sick type, copy, and pasting the function name. Right. So it, it would be good if the name of the function could be yeah, implicitly be detected. Uh, I, I couldn't tell you off the top of my head. Certainly, the line number and the. Yeah, it's just not as friendly. No, that's not as friendly. And, and with email, I mean, can't you send to the local mail queue? So we just get this was email. sending to the local mail queue. I don't know why it was so slow. I uh, I wasn't expecting it. I, I certainly got bitten hard by that one. So there's a question at the back here. Yeah, um, from a security viewpoint, um, is there any features within Python um, within the Python launcher for um, logging uh, functionality to to encrypt the log files or something? So the and question is. So the question is whether you can encrypt the log file. Yeah. Um, I haven't seen any functionality that does that. It wouldn't be hard to customize it to do whatever encryption you like there. Um, I'm not going to try and work out security implications while standing up. That's, that's a bad way of doing it. <laughs> but uh, certainly if you wanted your log files encrypted as they get passed across the network, sure. Uh, there's an HTTP um, handler and you could make that an HTTPS handler, it probably does that already. Uh, so that, that would make sure no one sniffing could see your, your log messages that way. Yeah, um, and the accountability, like to make sure that this computer was the actual computer that sent it, uh, rather than some other computer that's trying to do something malicious. Uh, I don't know how you'd authenticate some Python code. Python doesn't seem to, because Python you can go and insert code from other bits of code, um, I'm not sure how you'd ever prove that one bit of code raised something. I, I don't know if anyone has any opinions on, on that. I, I, I can't imagine how uh, you would stop another piece of code faking that it, it was this bit of code. Uh, definitely a sec uh, security and uh, security expert sort of question. So, any other questions? I will be in the pub if you want to ask me more there. Okay, so I hand you back to Dylan. Um, so I was just going to run through my lightning talk real quick.